Hello, friends. My name is Joel, and I serve as one of the pastors here at Panama Baptist Church. We're so glad that you've taken the time to join us online. And if you're with us at the live chat gathering and you haven't already, please say hello. We'd love to be able to greet you. Feel free to share a prayer request. We'd be honored to pray on your behalf. If you're watching this on YouTube, feel free to check out that live chat version. It's great to be able to watch things the same time as other people and to interact with them in that way. All right, for announcements this week, just one thing to let you know about. Uh, in a couple weekends from now, or actually if you're watching this on the weekend of August 14th, it's next Sunday, August 21st. Now, that's National Senior Citizens Day. Maybe you knew that, maybe not, but the village of Panama is kind of hosting some events. It's actually organized by somebody that goes here to PBC. It's going to be kicking off with a parade at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. So Sunday, August 21st, 1 p.m., there's going to be a parade. And this is for any senior citizen who wants to be in the parade. If that's you, that's always been a dream of yours, maybe to be in a parade, this is the chance for that dream to come true. Uh, it's going to start down at the school parking lot. You can gather down there, and it's going to head on down to the Methodist parking lot. That's where it'll wrap up. And you can walk, or you can drive, pull a boat, drive your tractor, ride a horse, uh, whatever you might want to do. Again, that's Sunday, August 21st, 1 p.m. If you're not in the parade, love to have you out to be able to encourage and honor our seniors. A lot of other activities happening that weekend as well. Uh, there's a $1 lunch for seniors at the Panama Diner that afternoon. There's going to be a movie and popcorn at the Methodist Church later on in the afternoon. I think that's at 3 o'clock. For a full list of activities or you just want some more information, email us, office at panamabaptist.org, and we'll get that information to you. Again, all that's happening next Sunday, the 21st, starting with the parade at 1 o'clock. All right, I think that's it for now. Let me pray to start our time together. God, thank you for the opportunity, the technology that we have to do something like this. God, I pray for the events of next weekend. that We would uh, just honor uh, the people that uh, have come before us, our, our senior citizens, that we can uh, show them just love and appreciation. Thank you for Birdie as she's been working on organizing a great event. God, I pray as we begin this new series in Ephesians that it would open up our hearts. We would be reminded of your grace and your goodness through the gospel of Jesus Christ. In your name we pray. Amen.
break the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. We're beginning a series through the book of Ephesians. Each of my years so far, we've gone through one of the short little Pauline epistles. Uh, the first year, we went through the book of Philippians. 
Last year we went through the book of Colossians. You might remember the tagline from that was worth it. Jesus Christ is worth it. Uh, the tagline for Ephesians is simply this, the gospel changes everything. I remember when I was a kid, I think it was my brother uh, was making cupcakes for his class at school. Maybe something like this has happened to you. Probably not, but maybe. Uh, he was making cupcakes for the kids at school, and don't ask me how. He, he was younger, and he was working on this. Don't ask me how, but somehow dish soap got in the batter for these cupcakes. The problem was they didn't know it until after everybody ate the cupcakes. <laughs> so you can imagine what happened when my brother came home and told my mom about somehow dish soap got in the cupcakes and he had some left over and we tried it and sure enough, there was dish soap taste just infused in the cupcakes and it was just nasty and pretty embarrassing uh, for, for my family. Uh, but dish soap had gotten in there and this one ingredient had changed everything about it. That cupcake was never gonna be the same. You know, the gospel works the same way. And as we go through the book of Ephesians, we've got to start here with these two verses that I just read in Ephesians chapter 2. We've, we've really got to understand what it is that Paul is saying here. Everything hinges on these two verses. How many times have you heard those verses? Maybe you've heard them lots of times before. Maybe for you, that was your first time. But do we really grasp, do we really get what it is that Paul is saying in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9? I mean, is, is he telling us some sort of equation like grace plus faith equals salvation? Or, or is he saying God plus me equals salvation? What is it that he's trying to communicate? What is Paul really saying in verse 8 when he says, This is not of yourselves. That word, this, he says, this is not of yourselves. This, it's not referring to the grace or the faith that he mentioned earlier. This is talking about the whole concept of salvation. When we talk about someone being saved, when we talk about salvation, what is it? What, what is actually happening when someone gets saved? Uh, who's involved? Is, is it God? Is it Jesus? Is it the Holy Spirit? Is it you? Is it me? Is it the people around us? Who's involved in salvation? What is the concept that Paul's talking about here in Ephesians chapter 2? Well, to truly understand that, to truly get the foundation of what Paul is doing, we need to go back to the beginning of the book. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1, and pick it up to understand this concept of salvation. Here we go, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, to the faithful saints in Christ Jesus at Ephesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. For He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before Him. He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace that He lavished on us in the Beloved One. Paul opens up this letter, as he often does, but then he begins to go on and explain this concept of salvation. And he's praising God along the way as he's going throughout all of it. And as we're going to read chapter 1, we see this explanation of salvation uh, kind of play out in three different parts. The, the heading for these parts, uh, this is a three-part equation, if you will. The heading for these parts uh, I borrowed from the Bible Knowledge Commentary. So, uh, But the first heading is the selection of the Father. That's what we just read. The first part of salvation, the first part of this equation, is the selection of the Father. Now notice how in Paul, verse 3, Paul is starting out uh, with a call to praise God. Blessed be God, he says. And he says that God has blessed us. That's in past tense there. That's what he's talking about. All of these things have already happened. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing. And Paul uses a couple of words that I want to key in on here. Specifically, that God chose us and predestined us. What do those two words mean here? Let's talk about first God chose us. 
Now you might have refer here you might have heard, excuse me, you might have heard this referred to as election. God chose us, God elected us, the doctrine of election. What that means is that it's God's loving choice of a certain individual to be his own. God is choosing some to believe. Uh, this choosing, it's, it's not dependent on human faith or deeds. Uh, verse 4 tells us this occurred before the foundations of the world. That's when God chose some to believe. Now, this concept of election might be new to you. It might not be something you've heard before, but we see this same concept talked about in Romans chapter 9. Here's what it says in Romans chapter 9, verse 10. And not only that, but Rebekah conceived children through one man, our father Isaac. For, now listen to this. For though her sons had not been born yet or done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to, elect, to election might stand, not from works, but from the one who calls. She was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. It's telling us here, not based on anything that they have done, God chose Jacob. God didn't choose Esau. And now, what's the goal of election? Verse 4 tells us that the goal of God choosing us is to be holy and blameless in the sight of God. So, God chose some to believe. And the second word that Paul tells us about there in Ephesians that I want to talk about for a moment is the word predestined. It's the action in which God decides from eternity, from before the foundations of the world, what will happen, these predestined things. Maybe you've heard that word before. And really, it's very similar to the idea of election. They're somewhat joined together. We can read more about this idea of predestined in Romans chapter 8. Verse 28 reads, We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. There's that called again. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. To be predestined means to be marked out beforehand. And so the emphasis here is more on the what than, than really the who. Uh, but the what is, is that we're chosen to be adopted as sons. I want to park on that phrase for just a moment, adopted as sons. Uh, through the selection of the Father, God chose some to believe to be adopted as sons, full-fledged sons of God with all the rights and benefits and privileges. We're not just partially on the team. We're not just partially in the club, one foot in the door. Uh, we have the full-fledged rights and benefits when we are adopted as God's son. Isn't that just a comforting thought? My wife and I are looking at taking a trip here in a few months. It's going to be our 20th wedding anniversary, and so we've been looking at where to go and how do we celebrate. We're thinking about going to Florida. Actually, we're pretty sure that we're going to go to Florida. In fact, we're pretty sure I've already actually bought airline tickets coming up the end of January. And so we bought tickets. We found a really great deal on tickets down to Florida. But through this deal, they, one of the, an advertisement popped up. And then through this advertisement, you could apply for a credit card, and if you were approved and you used the card to purchase your flight, you got a significant credit on your next statement. So I'm always looking for a deal, so I did that. So we got the credit card and we got the discount on our statement. But one of the other benefits that comes with this credit card is you get a, a pass that you can use one time when you're at the airport to go into the United Airlines. That was the airline we used, the United Club. I've never been in one of those. I think it's a, just a fancy lounge, a fancy place to wait at the airport. Maybe you've been in something like that. I don't fly enough to qualify to go into something like that. But through the benefits of this credit card, we get to go in one time. So we're flying down, and we've got a layover on the way down, and then we've got a layover on the way back. And so I'm looking at the flight schedules, trying to figure out, okay, when's our longest layover? When do we want to use this one-time pass? And then how do we use it? Like we're going to walk up to the door and say, hey, I think I'm allowed in here one time. And then you go in, and, and you're, you don't really feel like you fit in maybe. And, and it's kind of like I, I'm here one time, and then after this I'm not allowed back in here. So I'm in, but I don't really feel like I belong there. Maybe you've been in a situation like that. You know, it's not that way when God adopts us as sons. 
this isn't just a one-time pass where we're allowed to get the benefits and the rights one time, but after that, we can't use it anymore. No, I mean, if I had a, a, a pass, a lifetime membership into that club, I would go in like I belonged, like I knew that I was supposed to be there because I had been chosen and adopted to be in the club. And it's the same way when God adopts us as sons. So the first part of this equation, the first part of the concept of salvation is the selection of the Father. God, before the foundations of the world, not based on deeds or faith or action, but before the foundations of the world, chose us, predestined us, certain ones to be adopted into his family. Now, I appreciated what Pastor Andy did in a sermon a few weeks ago. He talked about the idea between a rabbit trail and, and, and an aside. You know, a rabbit trail is something the preacher might go down and he didn't plan to go down there. And he's not sure if he's ever going to get back to where he was, where an aside has a specific beginning and an end. It's kind of a set-aside subject and you planned to go there. Let me do an aside. As you're listening to this doctrine of predestination and election, it might be uh, natural for you to have some questions. I've thought of some of these same questions as well. I mean, this whole thing of predestination, did God choose us? There's a mystery here, right? A little bit. I mean, how does this all fit together? And if you've struggled trying to think through this idea of election and predestination, you're not alone in that, right? Because there's some questions that would just naturally come to mind when we're thinking through predestination. Like, why, why did God choose some, but he didn't choose others? Like, that doesn't seem fair. Or what about free will? Aren't I making the decision? How does free will and my ability to choose play into all of this? Or another question you might have is, well, if everything is predetermined, do I even need to evangelize? What, what do my actions even matter? Do I need to tell somebody about Jesus if God has already decided whether they're going to believe or not? Now, this doctrine of predestination, it's not at the center of the Bible. Right, Jesus Christ and the gospel are at the center. And I want to say that there are good Bible-believing people, people that I love and know and respect that disagree uh, with me on this. But I do think it's not just something to avoid. I think it's something we can try to work through and talk about. So let me give you just 30-second answers to those questions that I just made. This would be a plug for that Theology 101 class that we've been talking about in the last few weeks because this would be one of those doctrines we could really spend time diving deep on and digging into. Not going to have time in this format for that, but let me just try to give you 30-second answers to some of those questions. Let's start with the question about well, why did God choose some, but He didn't choose others? That, that doesn't seem very fair. And I'll tell you, this, this may be one of the toughest things to wrestle with. Right? Uh, because if, if God chose some to be saved, well, does that mean He chose to send others to hell? That's sometimes referred to as the doctrine of reprobation. Don't we know that 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord does not delay His promise, as some understand delay, but He is patient with you. He doesn't want, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. So how do we reconcile this verse with some of the verses that we just read? Well, we know that and believe the Scripture doesn't contradict itself, so there must be some explanation for all of this. Now, in this particular verse, and again, we would dig deeper into this in that Theology 101 class, I think it's understanding who the any is referring to when he says he doesn't want any to perish. But this question of why didn't God choose to save everyone, it's not really the best question to ask. I think the better question is, why didn't God condemn everyone to hell? The amazing fact in, this, in all of this is not that God condemns sinners to hell, but it's that He saves and reconciles some sinners to Himself. The doctrine of election and predestination, it is not the enemy of sinners. It is the friend. We need this doctrine. We need the fact that God has chosen to save People. So I don't think the question is, why did God choose to save some and not others? The question is, why didn't God just condemn everybody based on their actions to hell? That brings me to the next question then that we mentioned. Well, what about free will? Do I have, do I have a choice? 
if nothing matters, if everything is already predetermined, do I even need to evangelize? There's a doctrine called fatalism. This idea that, well, if everything is predetermined, then nothing I do actually matters. But we know that free will exists. I mean, Scripture calls for us to believe, right? Romans chapter 10, verse 13 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Acts 16, 31, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. I mean, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, the verses we read at the start of this, it references faith, right? So how does this idea of predestination and free will, how do they reconcile? I think there's a point where we step back and we say, you know, there's, there's a beautiful mystery happening here. There are, there are passages of Scripture that say God chose people to be saved. I've just read a couple of them for you. There's other places where Scripture indicates this. There's also passages of Scripture that reference belief or what you and I might call is free will. But just because you and I can't see how these two things can coexist together, it, it blows our mind, so to speak. We're limited in our knowledge and in our understanding. God somehow uses both. He's big enough for that. He's able to take this idea of election and free will and merge them together in ways that you and I can't understand. And I think there's a little bit of comfort in that. Uh, let me read a paragraph for you that I came across. Uh, this is written by two guys, one named Joel Beek and Paul Smalley, where they talk about predestination and free will merging together. Here, here's what it says. For those who struggle with predestination because they think that it implies fatalism, we acknowledge that God's will controls all His creatures and all their acts, uh, but assert as well that God decrees not only the end but also the means by which the end is achieved. Paul says, God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel. The means by which God saves his elect include the outward work of preaching the gospel and the inward work of the Spirit upon the mind, heart, and will of those who hear the gospel preached. I think that's a really good explanation of how these two things can work together. And look, I know in those brief answers, that's not going to answer all of your questions. And if you want to talk about it more, I'd be happy to do that with you. But Paul's point here in Ephesians chapter 1 isn't to get bogged down by this doctrine. Remember, he's just kind of explaining, laying the foundation for the concept of salvation, what it is he's talking about in Ephesians chapter 2. And he just kind of assumes, based on other scriptures that have been written, that we're just going to take what he says at face value. And so he just moves on. He says, here's what God did. He selected you. Here's the second part in the concept of salvation. It's the sacrifice of the Son. The sacrifice of the Son. Let me keep reading Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In Him we have, speaking of Christ, in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace that He richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure that He purposed in Christ is a plan for the right time to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth in Him. In Him we have also received an inheritance, because we were predestined according to the plan of the One who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of His will, so that we who had already put our hope in Christ might bring praise to His glory. In verse 7 it says that through Christ we have redemption. That literally means we have the release from slavery to sin. You and I were slaves in our sin, but if you're a Christ follower, if you've put your trust in Jesus Christ, He has set us free from being slaves to sin. God does not treat sins lightly. It required the sacrifice of blood. Hebrews chapter 9 says that with the shedding, without, excuse me, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And Christ's blood completely satisfied God's justice. And that's encouraging news for you and me because it answers the question, how much do I matter to God? How much am I worth to God? One commentator put it this way, the cost of Christ's blood is the measure of the wealth 
of God's unmerited favor to every believer. Jesus Christ, through his sacrifice on the cross, has set the sinner free. And from the beginning, before the foundations of the world, God chose us to be blameless. And in the history of the world, he actually makes it so through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we have the selection of the Father and then the sacrifice of the Son, without whom there would be no forgiveness of sins. But that's not all. There's one more. The seal of the Spirit. Verse 13. In Him you also were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. The Holy Spirit, listen to this now, the Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of His glory. When we believe, the Holy Spirit seals us. Literally, it's we're secured, we're closed up and sealed. It also means we're, we're authentic. We, we belong as adopted sons and daughters of God. And when you believed is when you were sealed. What does it mean to be sealed? To be sealed with the Holy Spirit is the gracious gift of God, whereby He demonstrates the authenticity of the believer's relationship with Him. And God demonstrates His authority and ownership and commitment to His people. The Holy Spirit is like a down payment on our inheritance. That's what the verse said. The Holy Spirit is a down payment. That God is serious. That God will uphold His end of the bargain. It's like when you go to buy something and, or you make a purchase. There's a non-refundable deposit sometimes. That trip that I mentioned earlier, we're kind of at that stage where you're starting to make decisions. Okay, are we going to stay here? Are we going to go here? Are we going to fly on that airline? And a lot of the places want a non-refundable deposit. And you're like, oh, is this, is this trip going to work out? You know, you're hearing a lot of flights are getting canceled. It's like, oh, I don't... I don't know if I want to give a non-refundable deposit because I don't know if this is going to work out and I kind of want that back if it's not. It's not how God works. God has given you, when you've believed in Him, the seal of the Holy Spirit, the down payment that God will do what He said He's going to do. Praise God. Isn't that amazing? So that brings us back to chapter 2 where we started. What is the concept of salvation? It's the three parts, right? The selection of the Father, the sacrifice of the Son, and the seal of the Spirit. Or it's God plus Jesus plus the Holy Spirit equals salvation. But what's missing from this equation? Or let me say it this way. What's, what's rightfully missing from this equation? What's the one thing that you might have expected to see here that's not there? Uh, us, right? Me. What, where do I fit in to all of this? Well, let me keep reading. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath as the others were also. But God who is rich in mercy because of His great love that He had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. He also raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavens in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming age He might display the immeasurable riches of His grace through His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift. Not from works so that no one can boast. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. And what an amazing passage this is. Look at some of the imagery that Paul writes here. In verse 1 he says that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. And he goes on to say in verse 5 that, that God made us alive. He made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in our trespasses. How can a dead person respond? 
right? A dead person can't do anything to save themselves. I don't think you can overstate this idea enough. We were dead in our sin. I think this plays into that doctrine of predestination, that God chose us and God made us alive because left to ourselves by nature, we were children of wrath and we couldn't respond being dead in our sins. What Paul is doing here in this beginning of the book is, is he's setting up the rest of the letter. He's going to talk about the gospel, what God has done for us, and how that changes everything. How the gospel infuses us and impacts what we do. That when we have a right-sized view of who God is and what God has done for us, that we were once there, dead in our sins, but now because of the selection of the Father and the sacrifice of the Son and the seal of the Spirit, we were once there, but now we're here. That should impact us and change the way that we live. Here's what we're going to look at in the rest of our series in Ephesians. Because the gospel changes everything, it impacts the way that we live with each other in the church. We're going to spend the next two weeks talking about unity. That's what Paul goes on to talk about in this next letter. And how does the gospel impact our unity? And is unity the end? Is unity the goal? Or is it the means to the end? We're going to talk about that for the next two weeks. The gospel impacts the way that we minister, the way that we're deployed to the people around us. Not only does the gospel impact unity in the church, but it impacts the church itself. What is the church? What are our goals? The gospel impacts that. We're going to talk about that in a few weeks. The gospel impacts the way that we have relationships with the people around us, the relationships of the people that God has put into our lives. The gospel changes all of that. It impacts the way that we fight our spiritual battles. I'm excited to look through this next, through the rest of the book and this series of how the gospel changes everything. But I want to step back and answer one more question. Why? Why did God do it? If it doesn't have anything to do with us, if God didn't choose us because of our actions, because of what we might bring to the team, why, why did He do it? But did you notice it as we've been reading these verses? Paul has interweaved the answer to this throughout all of these verses. Chapter 1, verse 5, according to the good pleasure of His will. According to His good pleasure that He purposed in Christ. Verse 11, who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of His will, so that we might bring praise to His glory. Chapter 2, verses 4 and 7, But God, who is rich in mercy because of His great love that He had for us, made us alive, so that in the coming ages He might display the immeasurable riches of His grace through His kindness. God exists to glorify Himself. Everything that God does is for His glory. It's not for you, it's not for me, but it's for His name's sake. And salvation, when we talk about this idea and this concept, it should cause us to look at God, not us. If Christ chose us and Christ made us alive, it's not that we were presented with two sets of facts and we were just smart enough to make the right decision. Salvation is about God. It's not about us. And God did it. God selected those to bring ultimate glory to Himself. The beginning of this book of Ephesians should serve to do a few things. Number one, give us reason to examine if we are living as one who has truly been changed by God's grace. Have you really been changed by God's grace and understand who we are in light of God? I mentioned how we're going to look at that in the coming weeks through the unity, minister to others, the church, the relationships that we have. But this concept of salvation should also serve to remind us that it's about God. It's not about us. God does not exist for us. We exist for Him. And the moment we begin to feel entitled or that God owes something to us, we've lost the plot. The beginning of Ephesians should serve to excite us, to rejoice that we have been set free from the slavery to sin. 
God chose you and has set you free. And you may be listening to this and thinking about making a decision to believe in Christ. And maybe the thought comes into your mind and says, well, I, I want to believe, but I don't, I don't know if God chose me. Well, that's where I would go back and lean into the wisdom of Scripture that says, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And if you believe and you make that choice, then God has chosen you. And the last thing that the beginning of Ephesians should serve to do is to cause us to marvel at the goodness of God. Right? I mean, God didn't have to do what He did. But He did it anyway. Why? Because it brings Him glory. and Because of His mercy and His great love for us. You know, the last series that I did was in the book of Joseph. And in the beginning of the book of Joseph, or not the book of Joseph, the story of Joseph, we talked about Joseph being down in the pit. Imagine yourself in a literal pit. Maybe you've fallen down in, and you can't get out. There's no way to get out. There is nothing that you can do, and you have lost all hope, and you're just sitting there waiting for the end. And someone comes along and says, I could leave you down there. I don't have to get you out. It's your fault that you're down there, but I'm going to pull you out. And what would happen in that? Man, we would be singing their praises, right? Like we would tell everybody we met about that. Man, I was in this pit and I was left for dead. But then this person came along and pulled me out. And it's the same thing with this concept of salvation, but on an eternal scale. The book of Ephesians is going to be here to remind us that we should marvel and sing and be excited about the goodness of God. And meditate on this concept of salvation and what it means. The three parts that are involved, God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, and what it means for you. And because of that, because of what God has done, it impacts everything else. The gospel changes everything. If you've got questions about something that you heard or you just need somebody to talk to or you want to make a decision about God, feel free to reach out to us. Give us a call. Send us an email. We'd love to have the opportunity to talk with you. Thanks for being with us this week. I'm praying for you uh, that you would meditate on these verses in Ephesians and what they really mean. Look forward to the rest of our study together. We'll see you next time.